broader COVID-19 vaccination coverage is prompting more questions about potential side effects and other related matters. So to answer some of those inquiries, I have Dr. Alice Hyun-Gyung Tan from Ms. Medi Women's Hospital. It is a pleasure to have you back, Dr. Tan. Thank you for having me. I also have Professor David Kwak from Sunjang University. Welcome back, Professor Kwak. Good afternoon, Sunny. Dr. Tan, before we delve into today's issue of interest, let's start with a few words from you regarding the latest surge in daily infections here on the local front. Right, so unfortunately the daily uh, caseload went above 2,000. Um, we have to wait and see just to see if perhaps there was one particularly large cluster that accounted for uh, a large number of these cases. But what we do know is week on week, the reproductive number had been increasing. So the end of September, it was uh, 1.2, then it went down below one for a few weeks. And then um, last week, uh, the number, the reproductive number started to go up again. And so what this means is uh, viral transmission may be on the upswing. Certainly, if you go into retail spaces, restaurants, they are packed. And so uh, it's not surprising that we're seeing numbers above 2,000 again. Right. And Professor Kwak, what are the implications then of this recent spike in daily infections, especially in light of our efforts to transition into a new normal? Well, the implication would obviously be the fact that we can never let our guards down yet. Uh, even though if we decide to go into the new phase of living with corona, so to speak, uh, I think it's not the best season to choose to do that yet because we're going into much colder season and as we have uh, felt in the past week or so, the, uh, the weather has gotten much colder. I think people are definitely gathering more inside and that exposes um, them to be uh, transmissible to others uh, relatively speaking to compare to uh, if they were to be on the outside. So to the multiples of different factors are coming into place here. The fact that we're going into the colder uh, uh, season and people will be a lot more gathering in the, on the inside. And also the fact that by stating that we will go into much easier restrictions, people already have had gotten themselves uh, relaxed about their tensions against this uh, fight against the virus. So I think um, this only iterates the point that unless we um, work together to really fight this virus off, there is always a chance that the virus to come back again even within the original strain that it used to be, or even it can, it can even possibly mutate itself to uh, still at attack us further. Now I'm going to be a little bit long here, but if I may re uh, refer ourselves back to the Spanish flu once again, at the end of the second huge wave, which we th still think it's the end of the, the, uh, the pandemic then, they had a half of the amplitude of the second wave that came right afterwards. There's always that chance for us too. So if, even if we saw a, a numbers to drastically go down, it's not the best time still yet for us to let our guards, guards down. Right, so we need to remain vigilant. Mm -hmm. All right then, now, Dr. Dan, do tell us, we're going to move into today's topic then, do tell us about, a bit about the possible physical discomforts following COVID-19 inoculation. Well, um, so we have very serious uh, physical um, side effects and then we also have not so serious side effects. Um, fortunately, the not so serious side effects are more common than the very rare serious side effects. Um, the more common uh, physical side effects include uh, pain that you could have in the ejection site, pain in the arm, swelling, redness, and then you have uh, what we call systemic symptoms. So uh, symptoms such as fever, chills, headache, um, muscle achiness, uh, joint pain. I'm just thinking about what I felt, uh, nausea, vomiting, fatigue. These can all be some physical side effects and they do tend to occur uh, more commonly in younger uh, people than older people. And uh, that's to be expected because these side effects, they show that the vaccine is working. Um, if you have a very strong immune system that's mounting an uh, immune response against the vaccine, you're going to have these side effects. And so actually it's, it's not a bad thing to have these side effects actually to feel them. It means that the uh, vaccine is working. In terms of the serious side effects, um, we are talking about anaphylaxis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, um, and uh, myocarditis and pericarditis. Of course, myocarditis, pericarditis, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, these tend to occur more frequently in younger 
uh, people. And then the Guillain-Barre syndrome was found to be more frequent in men greater than the age of 50. So there is a, an age differential in these uh, adverse events. Right. Dr. Dan, I experienced absolutely no side effects after my own vaccination. Does that mean my immune system is sleeping? Uh, no, I mean, I, maybe you just lucked out. I, I don't think that um, it means that there's no reason why your immune system would not have worked against the vaccine. Right. There are some people, though, with, uh, who are immunocompromised or who are very elderly. They do have a hard time mounting an immune response against the vaccines. And in these people, actually, the recommendation is to get a third additional dose. It's not called a booster. They actually need three doses to get full immunity. I see. Meanwhile, Professor Kwok, there is talk, as Dr. Dan has mentioned, that such post-inoculation uh, responses are indications of a very strong immune system. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Right. So continuing on from what Dr. Tan was mentioning, um, so when we uh, see uh, much more frequent side effects in the younger generation, we try to explain it by saying it's because the younger generations, their immune system is stronger than the older generation. And I'm being careful not to completely characterize it only that way because it may not explain 100% all of all the occurrences. For some people like yourself and like myself maybe too, uh, even uh, who could be considered younger generations could pass without a certain side effects despite uh, having been inoculated for the completion of the vaccination. It does not mean that you didn't have an immune response to the vaccine. It does not mean that you're no longer be protected from, from the virus even after the vaccine. It still means that you will be protected. So I'm being careful not to uh, decide that it's 100% of the explanation. But there is a tendency for much older generations to weaken in their immune responses. So even for other types of vaccines other than that for COVID-19, older generations do tend to show less of certain side effects from receiving the vaccine. So uh, when we talk about these side effects, it's okay to not have side effects or it's okay to still side have side effects for any other uh, 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 the, uh, age groups. Um, it does not necessarily mean that they are stronger in their protection or less in their protection. Right, so there is no need to generalize then. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tan, is it true that receiving an mRNA vaccine on your right arm reduces the risk of myocarditis and pericarditis? Absolutely untrue. So this is a superstition. I don't know where it came from. Um, some people think that uh, it has something to do with the location of your arms relative your, to your heart. But I mean, it's anatomically, that doesn't make any sense because your heart is pretty much in the center of your chest equidistant from either your left or right arm. Also, this, uh, you know, mRNA vaccines and all the vaccines are intramuscular. They're not injected into a vein. Um, they're intramuscular and from there they go into the cells. From the cells, the proteins are released and those go into the lymphatic system. They're then taken up by the lymph nodes. So there's absolutely no anatomic basis, mechanistic basis. Um, for this um, misinformation. Also, um, in terms of myocarditis and pericarditis, uh, we think that the underlying pathophysiology, so the reason behind this phenomenon is sort of a, a systemic immune response, not really related to anything that's happening in a, a particular arm. So um, absolutely not true. Right, and it is also very rare for you to experience myocarditis or pericarditis after COVID-19 in inoculation. Yes, very rare. And I should say nine out of 10 people do not have any symptoms after COVID-19 vaccination. Right, that is so good you're to in know. the majority. Oh, right. <laughs> also, Dr. Dan, some people claim that only certain painkillers can be taken to ease inoculation-related uh, discomforts like um, a headache or muscle ache. Is this true? No, there's no uh, brand superiority when it comes to alleviating the symptoms after vaccination. So we recommend taking acetaminophen in any form, generic or brand name, it doesn't matter. Or you can use a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug such as ibuprofen um, or even aspirin. So um, th there's no preference really uh, for one over the other. Uh, and um, I think there's some perhaps uh, internet, you know, articles about a particular brand being 
superior, but that's absolutely not true. Right. What about drinking coffee after COVID-19 vaccination? Uh, well, you know, if you develop a fever, you know, as your side effect, um, in general, we recommend trying to stay well hydrated. Uh, and if you take a beverage such as uh, coffee or tea that can act as a diuretic, that could actually lead to dehydration. So that's why in general we say if you have a fever, you should avoid drinking coffee um, and try to drink other fluids such as water that's going to keep you well hydrated. Right. Professor Kwok, given concerns of breakthrough infections, a growing number of fully vaccinated people are seeking um, COVID-19 antibody screenings through the use of self-test kits, which are no longer being sold at local pharmacies, of course. How accurate now are these self-test kits? Right. So when they first came out, they claimed to have very high accuracies. They were showing up to about 95% of its uh, specificity and sensitivity. But given that those antibody testing kits were developed uh, based on the original strain of these viruses, and they were not neutralizing antibodies that they were detecting, but rather morphological structure that they created the antibodies to. Now, having said that, uh, there were um, some mishaps and, uh, that could confuse general public when they were given to, uh, for, uh, to be in use by the unprofessional people because I've actually done it my, uh, on myself about five to six times. I've actually noticed every time it deferred in the time for the antibody to show up. So some people could come up with the antibody level, let's say 30 to 40 minutes later, but we would consider that insignificant because it has to be detected within 30 seconds to three minutes. Not only that, so it's an it's a, a, a issue with a, the professional use of it. Number two, because it's not a neutralizing antibody that they're detecting, whether or not it actually detects an antibody does not necessarily equate to the protection level the person is having against the virus. So some people actually told me when they came into my clinic that if they, this, uh, they detected antibody in the kit, they would decide not to go on with their vaccine schedule further. So I, was, I had to explain to them that this does not mean a full protection uh, from the inoculation against the virus. So that's further why they, it, it was taken off of the OTC level, but it was only, it's now only being used by professionals. But when do people come into my clinic to have uh, antibody testing to test themselves if they have immunity or not, I clearly explain to them this does not necessarily mean 100% of the protection, even if somebody was to come out with antibody, he may or may not be still be protected from the virus. Right. I have another true or false question, Professor Kwok. Some people are saying mm -hmm. that getting either the COVID-19 vaccine or the seasonal vaccine will be enough to protect you from a possible twindemic. Are they right? Absolutely not. So it's um, the twindemic. When, when, when people receive a certain type of vaccine, it makes, me, it makes them feel that they're boosted in their immunity against any sorts of viruses. And that is entirely not true. Any kinds of vaccines, they're specifically designed for a particular virus. And uh, for example, in this case, uh, a, a vaccine against uh, COVID-19 versus vaccine against uh, influenza is completely different in, in the senses of manufacturing, coming up with designs, and also the types of viruses they're attacking against. So if a person was to have received COVID-19 vaccine, he would definitely not still be protected against influenza virus and vice versa. So uh, having received any one of the vaccines to be uh, protected from the twindemic, it's only partially true, but absolutely not true against both of the cases. So you need to get both the COVID-19 vaccine and the seasonal flu vaccine. Absolutely, and you can receive both at the same time as well. On the same day? Mm -hmm. Right. Dr. Dan, is it necessary to get the seasonal flu vaccine this year if one got that vaccine last year? Yes, so um, in terms of the durability of the seasonal flu vaccine, it only lasts maybe six to eight months, you know, one year at the most. And so if you got the vaccine last year, it will have worn off uh, by now. Also, the formulation for the seasonal influenza vaccine changes every year. There's something called antigenic drift that goes on. So the influenza virus, it mutates. And we've seen this with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? It mutates. And so we need to come up with a new formulation for the seasonal flu vaccine every year. 
Uh, and so just because you got one last year does not mean that this protection is going to go into this season. Um, and so if you are a healthcare worker or you're in a high risk group, such as pregnant women, children, you have a chronic uh, medical condition, you definitely should get the uh, influenza vaccine again this year. Right. And Dr. Dan, we've been told that the wearing of face masks last winter uh, saw a, a tangible reduction in the number of flu patients for last winter. If I plan on wearing my face mask every day, all the time, do I not need to take take the flu vaccine? <laughs> well, so there are what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as wearing a mask, washing your hands, keeping social distancing. These have all worked very well to, we dodged the bullet against uh, a flu epidemic last year. We also managed to decrease the prevalence of a lot of respiratory illnesses, uh, such as chicken pox and, and other uh, uh, diseases that can be passed through respiratory droplets. So it does work, but the best way to protect your get yourself against influenza is to get the vaccine. It's, it's free, it's available, uh, I highly recommend it. Right. Moving on, Professor Quax, come November, one will need to prove that he or she has been vaccinated or is uninfected uh, with COVID-19 to access certain venues. Could you tell us a bit about these venues and about the people who will need to submit these verifications? Right, so main uh, theme of this plan is that uh, they want to sh uh, use sort of the vaccine pass system for anybody who's willing to go into a confined space, especially namely those heavily populated spaces such as gyms, restaurants, or uh, nursing homes per se. Uh, so they are going to be required to show their vaccine passes when they're entering these venues. But if they haven't completed or haven't gotten their vaccines, they're supposed to come up with uh, proof that they are negative through the RT-PCR method of the COVID-19 disease. But the thing is, COVID-19 RT-PCR test, test is only valid for about two to three days. So they would have to get their test done every 48 hours or two to three days to be able to use these venues. Now, um, also people who are exempted from uh, receiving vaccines if, uh, are not exactly mandated to show the proof of negativity uh, if they are either under age, such as under 18 years of age, or they have not gotten vaccine due to medical reasons. But I think the government is still um, discussing whether or not to go ahead with that particular plan because there are still chances for these two people to be either infected or to transmit to other people. Now, medical sector is a, another important issue that we have to discuss here. For regular general medical sectors, I think they're going to implement the vaccine pass system, which they haven't before, but that does not mean that people who need medical uh, care without passes or uh, inoculation or, or the RT-PCR um, result could not access. So it means that per case, if it becomes necessary for them to enter the venue, they will still be led into the hospital, especially in the emergency room setting. Even currently, we test those people who are being suspic uh, um, suspicious of having COVID-19 to be isolated until they're proven of the negativity of uh, COVID-19 until they're properly treated. So all these sectors are, uh, are currently being cared of, um, completely right now, but starting in November, we're also going to utilize vaccine passes to have access to these certain venues. Healthcare facilities then? Healthcare facilities, as well as other confined spaces such as singing rooms and bars and restaurants. And with the option, of course, of a negative PCR test. Absolutely. If my daughter had a problem, let's say she was not feeling well, and she had to come see you at your clinic, mm -hmm. would she have to be fully vaccinated in order to meet you? Well, if she's under 18, she's she ex is. exempted. You know, if she is under 18, she's exempted from all those mandates. But if she happens to be an adult who hasn't been vaccinated, then she would need to come up with the uh, proof that she is negative of the disease. Right. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dan, I believe you were in the U.S. for quite a while before recently returning to Korea. Do compare for us the use of such verifications over in the U.S. and here on the local front. Well, right now, we're not, you know, we don't have a vaccine pass system, but um, I was in Washington State. Um, I think starting October 25th, so not that long ago, uh, the state has mandated that uh, in order to enter into a restaurant, you had to show proof of vaccination. Uh, and in California, where my daughters are, one of my daughters tried to go to a social event uh, on campus. It was just a, a, a party, um, uh, and they were very strict. They said they needed to see the original 
vaccination document, a photograph was not accepted, and basically she was denied entry. Um, but it's not just uh, you know, proof of vaccination. I think uh, in terms of the private sector, there are many companies now that are requiring vaccination for employment. For example, United Airlines, they have required uh, full vaccination to be employed at their company. And they ended up firing 1% one per, one of their workforce, people who refused to get vaccinated. Uh, and so it's not just uh, from a government perspective, but um, from the private sector as well. Uh, people realize that if you are unvaccinated, you can be a liability, a healthcare liability, but also financial liability to the institution or the group that you're entering. Uh, and so vaccine passes are being uh, implemented and also you need to show proof of vaccination to continue employment in many instances. Right. Currently, Dr. Dan, here in Korea, COVID-19 tests are free of charge, mm -hmm. but there is talk that it, that might change as we transition out of the pandemic. What is it like elsewhere? Um, well, just like vaccinations, you know, testing is such a crucial component to getting COVID-19, you know, under control. And when we want to have a public health measure that we want a lot of people to participate in, we need to eliminate any obstacles, you know, facilitate the process as much as possible. So we want to make it free. We want to make it accessible, easy, you know, to get to. And so in the United States, um, anyone can go for a COVID PCR test really um, free of charge. They have a lot of drive-through centers still, uh, and it's very easy to get this done. No questions asked, you just uh, register and it's done. Uh, I think um, for the time being, having a free testing program is going to be uh, very important. Um, if we start to have these obstacles, to getting vaccinated or to getting tested, it's just going to undermine our uh, public health strategy. Right. Professor Kwak, what, meanwhile, are some issues to consider amid efforts to expand COVID-19 inoculations to younger children aged between five and 11 in your view? Well, I'll be quite frank with you. I have children who are from five to nine years of age, three children actually, uh, the U.S. is currently talking about, well, not currently talking about, they're implementing their plans to actually inoculate children of those ages as well. The fact is that Pfizer and Moderna, they are reducing their dosages uh, for uh, when it is inoculated to children under 12 years of age. Uh, the dosage exactly is about a third of the dosage that will be inoculated to the adults. Uh, they're um, adjusting the dosage probably because of the metabolism issue and also their body weights according to their body weights. I would ponder myself quite for a long time before going ahead with you know, inoculation to my children, but at least for the time being, I clearly know that it helps them, it, get, it protects them. So I guess probably after a brief thinking, I would definitely decide to inoculate my children if the, given the chances. I just don't know how soon Korea will follow the steps of the FDA to actually allow, uh, or at least for the emergency use, uh, for the children to be inoculated as well. Professor Kwok, speaking as an ordinary person, I wonder what you can tell me about how dosages appear to depend on a person's age or a child's age instead of a child's weight, I would think. Well, for some, some medications, actually, they do depend on uh, body weight. But some other cases, they have, they have a completely different functionality of metabolisms compared to adults. They don't have the fully grown liver. They don't have fully grown kidneys yet to metabolize the medications and let out uh, the, the remaining particles. So that's further why they defer either dosages or even types of medications when it's applied to different ages. I see. All right, Professor Kwak, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts. And thank Dr. Dan, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.